So welcome everyone. Uh, this is plenary talk number four, entitled Signal Processing for Domain Rigid Machine Learning, Speech and Biomedical Applications by Professor Thiago Falk. Uh, I'll be waiting one or two minutes more, not more than this, uh, for people that are coming, uh, maybe from the coffee break. <laughs> uh, I'll be speaking in English, uh, as you may notice, uh, to follow Thiago's uh, presentation, which I believe will, will be also done, performed in English, okay? Uh, so just uh, wait for one or two minutes more for people to come. Everyone is welcome. Welcome everyone to beautiful Florianopolis, as you can see here in my background. And uh, nice food, nice people. Nice weather. I'm sure the weather is much nicer than here. <laughs> it's true. You are in Montreal, aren't you? Yes. Chiang is in Montreal. Uh, yeah, in November is for sure. November for sure. So this is my weather. <laughs> hmm. Welcome, welcome everyone for this talk. Congratulations to all the organizers and with all the difficulties, uh, but the, meet, the meeting has been going very smoothly, at least in the sessions I've been participating. And, uh, okay, let's go. Let's, uh, we have a tight schedule, too many good things to fit in. in. And uh, well, first of all, thank you everyone for coming. My name is Sergio Neto from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. I'm here to host uh, this excellent talk by Professor Thiago Fall, which is a, who is an associate professor at the Institut National de la Recherche Scientifique in Canada and the director of the Multimedia and Multimodal Signal Analysis Enhancement Lab in Montreal. Uh, Tiago will be talking about signal processing for domain enriched machine learning, speech and biomedical applications. And uh, if anyone has a question, you may write it, uh, it down in the chat, I believe. Uh, and those should be answered at the end of Tiago's fall, uh, Tiago's fall talk. Okay. And uh, so I you, thank you, Tiago, for uh, being part of this event. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I cannot pay you a dinner as you as you did to me when I came to Montreal. So uh, I owe you one when uh, we meet again. Uh, thank you for being part of the telecommunications symposium of the Brazilian society. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me, uh, Professor Neto. Thank you for all the organizers. Boa tarde a todos. Farei a apresentação em inglês, mas no final, se precisarem de fazer alguma pergunta em português, podem ficar também à vontade. I'm just checking that you can see my slides. Yes, I can. Yeah, perfect. Should be fine. So, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you uh, for having me. As Professor Sergio said, I'm a uh, professor at the National Institute of Scientific Research here in Montreal. We're part of the University of Quebec. And I'd like to share with you today um, some of the work that we've been doing to bring together, I'm just putting the timer here so I don't run over, um, how to bring together signal processing with machine learning. And I'll be focusing on speech and biomedical applications. I was looking at the uh, program for the conference and there seems to be many papers across these two domains. So hopefully this will spark some interest uh, to most attendees at the conference. Um, I don't think I need to convince you that machine learning and in particular deep learning has revolutionized many domains in the last uh, five to six years. Um, we've seen innovations in, for example, the use of AI and machine learning to invent new drugs for language models, for speech recognition, for diagnostics. Um, and I don't think I also have to convince you that this is not something that will go away tomorrow. This is something that's here to stay. 
So projections, these are somewhat outdated now, but these are projections of where this machine learning and artificial intelligence market, where it's predicted to go. So you see a, a linear increase over the next few years. Um, you might be asking yourself, well, these are projections from 2015. There was no uh, pandemic being predicted halfway through these projections. So is the pandemic going to be affecting uh, this type of market? My assumption is that it's not um, for multiple reasons. There's already some indications here, but one, everybody's at home. Everybody's consuming information online. Uh, data is being generated more than we ever imagined. And as you know, today, data is the new gold, data is the new oil. Um, so there's already some indications as to how uh, this data is actually boosting artificial intelligence. Um, we've seen everybody go to virtual conferences and virtual meetings, everybody working from home. So there's now all of a sudden this huge impact on bandwidth consumption and video transferring over the net. So this has brought researchers together to try to come up with new ways of performing video compression. So you might have seen a couple of weeks ago, NVIDIA came out with their new AI-based video compression algorithm specifically for this type of uh, scenario where we are now just face-to-face. -face. You just have the face that you're transmitting. There's not a lot of movement. So there they've shown that with artificial intelligence, you can actually get orders of magnitude, lower bandwidth uh, with even perhaps better quality than you would with traditional signal processing based methods. So this pandemic has driven a lot of innovations in this space. And as a pandemic, it affects billions of people worldwide. So as we move forward with vaccines or as we move forward with tracing of the disease and tracking it, this is gonna be again data from billions of people that will be made available. So I predict that this is one of the areas uh, that will have very little impact due to the pandemic. But of course, as the old saying goes, um, every technology you invent, or as, as the, the, the saying goes, when you invent the ship, you also invent the shipwreck. So not only do you have all the advantages of machine learning and artificial intelligence, but they also bring some limitations and challenges. Um, this is just a few examples of some of the things that I will touch on this presentation. But uh, one of the ones that's most known is the interpretability. So you have a model where you provide it data, it learns patterns in that data, and it spits out great results. But you don't know what it's doing, what, it's, um, what type of patterns it's finding. Um, most that you can do is look at weights and uh, weight distributions. So this in healthcare, for example, this black box effect in healthcare is a big issue. Um, again, it's a data-driven method, so it will learn patterns in the data that it's seen. And if your test data is, there's a large mismatch between your training and your test set, then you're gonna have very poor performances. And this is typically the case of what we call in the wild. So when you are in a realistic setting where now you have varying lighting conditions, you have noise, you have, uh, applications where the human put on the device wrong on their body, so it's measuring the wrong data. So this type of in the wild performance, poor in the wild performance is also a factor that uh, is crucial in machine learning. Um, you've probably, if you've monitored the uh, elections in the US over the last couple of months, deep fakes was a big issue. This is where you use artificial intelligence to generate videos or to generate text um, that is not real. Um, and again, very similar to the training and test mismatch where noise plays a factor. Uh, if you're a bad person, you can actually carefully craft a specific noise pattern that will cause your network to fail. So these are called adversarial attacks. So again, you can see what type of uh, limitation this could have in biomedical applications. Of course, something also that's being talked a lot about now is the environmental impact of all of these algorithms the uh, computational complexity, the amount of resources that are needed to train these models, the storage requirements. So the environmental impact is also something that's a uh, severe challenge that uh, the community is facing today. And of course, your model is only as good as the data it's trained on. So if you have biases in the data and so on, you're gonna have biases in models. So there's the uh, emerging area on ethics and AI and ethical AI and so on. So these are just some few challenges. There are many, many more. I won't go into all of them here, 
but these are just some that uh, we have been looking at recently. Um, so as black, block, black box approach, as I mentioned, um, the typical way of using these neural networks is you have some data, you have a model, you train your model on this data, it gives you great performance, but then at the end of the day, you don't really know what it is that the model is looking at. Um, so about a year ago, a year and a half ago, it was all in the news about how a uh, set of researchers from a hospital published a deep neural network that was able to, from X-ray images, detect uh, pneumonia within the X-rays. They were able to do this with 93% accuracy, and it was all over the news how they were better than uh, clinicians, how they did it much faster, much more accurate, and so on. Uh, a couple of months later, same system was tested on data collected from another hospital, and that performance dropped from 93% to 73%. So as it turned out, in the first hospital, patients who had pneumonia couldn't leave their beds. So doctors had to wheel in a portable x-ray machine. Person was lying down on the bed. They made an x-ray of their lungs. The control patients who did not have pneumonia could get up, could go to the normal x-ray machine. They would stand and they would get an x-ray of their chest. So now these two different sets of x-rays were used to train the model. And as it turns out, the model wasn't really detecting pneumonia. It was either detecting how the fluid was being displaced when the person was lying down versus standing up, or it could have been just monitoring or, or detecting differences in the quality of the images from one portable machine to another non-portable machine. So at the end of the day, it wasn't very clear what it was that the model was doing other than it was able to, in one hospital, detect if the person was lying down from the portable machine or standing up in the non-portable machine. So you can see how this type of approach can be problematic uh, in the healthcare domain. If we look at training and testing mismatch, here's another example of how adding noise to an image or to a system causes the performance to drop. This is somewhat outdated now. This is a few years old. This is looking at VGG16 and Google Net performance, for example. But if you have an image recognition system and you add or blur or Gaussian noise or even compression to the, uh, to the image, you can see that as the level of the distortions increases, your performance drastically or very quickly drops to about uh, 0% with a uh, sufficient amount of noise. So imagine you are now a biomedical engineer that's pushing for wearable technologies to be used for healthcare. And we know that these types of technologies are very sensitive to movement artifacts. So now if you have a system that's measuring electrocardiograms and once the person starts running and the signal becomes distorted, what type of implications could this have on a system that's now running in the wild, um, as I mentioned? So these are definitely areas that need to be um, tackled within the machine learning world. And within a very similar setting, uh, previously these were just environmental noises that were causing uh, distortions or causing errors in a system. Um, if you have some malicious intent, you could actually carefully craft a specific noise type that if you add to your signal of interest, for example, this image of a pig, this noise source is imperceptible to the human eye, so you can't discriminate uh, that anything was done to tamper this image, but it was created in such a way that it makes the network on purpose make a mistake. So you, your network would previously say correctly that this is the image of a pig. After you add this imperceptible type of noise, the network now becomes very confident that this is an airliner. So if you have malicious intent, you could actually um, generate malicious uh, attacks to a network. And these are what are called adversarial attacks. So this, you can imagine if you're talking about self-driving cars and researchers have shown, for example, that if you tamper um, with just four little strips of paint in a stop sign, you can have at the time a state-of-the-art system think that instead of a stop sign, this was a speed limit of uh, 45 miles per hour. So you can clearly see the type of implications this can have not only in biomedical, but in autonomous vehicles, in face recognition, which is something that's also emerging worldwide where researchers from Carnegie Mellon University show that if you, um, on someone's glasses, if you just uh, printed this very unique type of uh, adversarial noise, 
it could make the state of the art face recognition system at the time make very drastic uh, errors. So you can see here, um, the bottom images are what the image recognition system was detecting, whereas the top image is what was presented as input. So you can see um, there again in face recognition where you can have a lot of privacy concerns as well. And recent research published in Nature and Science, for example, is showing the impact that this can have within the biomedical space. So again, the, the, the lung issues where before you could have errors, but now you're actually causing the system to make errors by adding a very uniquely crafted type of noise where you have a system that would be able to characterize this correctly with very high confidence to actually being very highly confident of its decision, but it's now a wrong decision. So this could have um, drastic effects in healthcare. And again, here with electrocardiograms, it was shown that with a very smooth and subtle perturbation, you could actually generate type one and type two errors um, with an automated system that's tracking arrhythmias in a uh, ECG. And again, deep fakes. Um, so you've seen how neural networks could be generating video, could be generating content. You could generate video even from a still image. So the type of implications this could have on biometrics and on generating fake content and so on. So this is another area that's of great concern to the community. Um, going to computational complexity and storage. Um, most of 2019 saw models, as you can see here at the bottom, typically from Microsoft and Facebook and so on. Um, so last year, when we talked about big models, we were talking about models with 300 million parameters, 600 million parameters, and so on. Um, earlier this year, Microsoft came out with what was a revolutionary um, model, which was called a Turing model. It was a language parameter used for their uh, NLP research and it had 17 billion. So this is a billion with a B. So you can see here the drastic increase in the amount of parameters this model uh, relied on. And you can see here uh, OpenAI with its GPT and GPT-2 uh, models, language models. Within a year, they increased from 110 million to 1.5 billion. And when they saw this Microsoft model come out with 17 billion uh, parameters. They basically said, hold my beer. And six months later, they came out with what we now know as GPT-3. And that is the largest model that's known uh, to date. It has 175 billion parameters that need to be trained. So you can see an order of magnitude greater than uh, Microsoft's model from earlier this year. So what kind of impact does a model that requires 175 billion parameters to be trained have on the environment? As it turns out, a significant one. Uh, researchers from MIT, for example, reported last year, and this was again at a time where 200 million parameters were the standard, they actually showed that to train a transformer model with 213 million parameters, it required the carbon footprint of six cars, or five cars, sorry, and now I'm talking about the actual entire lifetime. So 10 years of five cars, the carbon footprint that five cars have in 10 years, it was about the same kind of carbon footprint that one model with 213 million parameters generated. Um, so now a year later, we're talking about 175 billion parameters. So we've gone orders of magnitude higher. So you can quickly see how these types of uh, innovations can actually have an impact on the environment. So instead of having green technologies, these are what's called very red technologies, so very bad for the environment. So there are company nows where you can go, there are websites that you can go. Uh, here's an example of one. You can type in what GPU you used, how many GPUs you used, how long you ran them for during training, and that'll calculate your CO2 impact that you had. And the numbers are drastic, the numbers are high. I invite you to go and test it out yourselves. And this has been one of the pushes for um, edge AI and distributed and federated learning, uh, compressions of models and scalings of models. And the whole purpose is to make these models as small as possible so that you don't have this much of a uh, footprint on the environment. 
Um, ethical AI here, I won't go into too much detail, but you can imagine if you're feeding your models with data that is biased, then you can only imagine um, what types of, of patterns these models are learning. Um, so over the last few years, several of these big corporations, such as Microsoft and Amazon, have learned the type of PR nightmares that uh, these algorithms can have based on how badly the data is that you used to train. And GPT-3 here uh, is a model that's being told as or sold as the model that can generate books and can generate text and can generate song based on just few lines of code um, or a few lines of input. And there were some researchers from France this week. I don't know if some of you have seen this in the news or not, but in France this week, some researchers use this as a chat or, or as a chat type assistant that would treat patients who would call in to a service and it would basically serve as a uh, prior step to them talking to the doctor. And up to the first few interactions, everything was great. Patient said, hello, it's talked back. And then after a while, the patient started opening up and saying, yes, I'm very depressed, um, mental health issues with this pandemic. I'm thinking of killing myself. Is this something you can help me with? And then the GPT-3 came back saying, yes, this is definitely something I can help you with. And then the patient types back, oh, so you can help me kill myself. And then GPT-3 comes back and says, yeah. So it took headlines this week as if it's something that it still has its limitations. So even though it can generate text on the fly, it has the largest language model available, it still does not have knowledge or understanding of what's going on. Um, so it could have serious effects. Um, so as a researcher, you can ask yourself, well, what can we do? These are serious limitations. These are things that could limit the advances of uh, machine learning and, and uh, what can we do? So as a signal processing guy at heart, of course, uh, my first uh, reaction is, well, signal processing can do that. Um, over the last few years, of course, DNNs have come out as the winners. There are several people, even leading researchers in machine learning that are claiming that DNNs, uh, it was even out in the news this week, DNNs are gonna solve every single problem. Um, so there has been a big push from the machine learning community to solve all of these problems using machine learning. And what I hope you take out from today's talk is that it's, my view is that it's no longer one or the other. It can't just be bigger neural networks or better neural networks solving the issues of neural networks. And it can't just be signal processing anymore. It has to be something that has to be the two together that um, have to work together to solve some of these problems. So this is what I hope to show you today in my presentation are some of the examples of how this uh, has been achieved in our lab. So this is just some motivation for you to understand um, how this could be possible. So if you envision this top representation here where you have a system, you have data that has gone through some sort of mapping. It has some nuance factors, some noise. This could be noise if you're talking about speech. This could be the uh, x-ray machine uh, artifacts that we talked about from the x-ray example. And what's typically done is you now you have this signal that's noisy. You don't really know what the source was, but this is what you use to train your models. So you get great performance, but then it breaks down in unseen conditions. You don't have interpretability and so on. So it's basically a black box. So what if you could, for example, with signal processing, if before you trained your model, you could apply some sort of signal processing to your output. And if your, your data had signal that was buried in noise, what if through signal processing, you could enhance that signal? By doing this, you could now have a network that's a lot more clever because one, it's not gonna be wasting parameters on noise. It's gonna be utilizing the parameters to actually discriminate what it is that you want to discriminate. So you can, you're likely to get much better performance, much higher accuracy with much fewer parameters. So this helps you tackle the, uh, the complexity and the environmental impact. If you're now focusing on just the signal component, you can get better interpretability. You can remove the noise artifacts so you can get better uh, robustness against uh, mismatch training and testing mismatch. And the same now, if you have your output and if you can use signal processing to actually separate your nuance factors from your actual input. So now you know what is input, you know what is the noise. 
So again, here you could have a lot more interpretability. You can have a lot better performance in the wild and it could potentially even help detecting these deep fakes because now you know what the true type of signal was. So a lot of our work uh, in the lab has relied on this particular signal processing tool, which we call the modulation spectrum or modulation spectrogram. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with this typical uh, on the left here representation, which is a time frequency map where you go from basically a time series, a time domain signal. You can apply, for example, a wavelet transform, or you can apply a short term Fourier transform or a DCT or something, and you end up with a time frequency representation. This is used widely today in uh, machine learning with speech. This is spectrograms are used when you're talking about biomedical applications, wavelet coefficients are used. So this is widely used in uh, machine learning today. But the major drawback there is that a lot of the nuance factors, a lot of the artifacts, a lot of the con contextual information that's available in the signal actually overlaps with the signal of interest in this representation here. Um, so what we've been doing is we've been uh, showing that if you apply a second transformation now across this time dimension, and we call this a modulation transform, you end up with a frequency frequency representation that tells you how each of these frequency bins are modulated over time or how they're changing over time. And as it turns out, signals of interest are constrained, especially if you're talking about speech or physiological signals our bodies constrain those signals to lie in a specific area in this space. Whereas when you're talking about noise or you're talking about artifacts or you're talking about contextual factors, they tend to lie outside of this domain. So now this representation separates signal from noise much better than the time frequency representation does. And the beauty of this modulation spectrogram is now this is an image, it's a spectrogram um, that you can use to train your neural networks, but it has a lot more discriminative information. And if these transformations are invertible, you can actually do a lot of your processing in this representation here. You can filter, you can scale, you can compress, and then you can go back in time and have a much better signal input that you can apply to your machine learning algorithms. Um, so with speech, for example, it is known that we can't, due to limitations of articulators, we can't really change our frequency content very fast. And there's, for the last 50 years, there's research showing that usually this information is constrained uh, up to about 16 Hertz in the modulation frequency. Um, we'll see a few slides here that will confirm that information. Uh, and the same is true with physiological signals. So you know that your heart rate beats at a specific rate. It can't change very fast. Uh, your breathing also can't change very fast. The firing of your uh, neural signals also have a very constrained uh, area in which they operate. And this area is typically very different from where the artifacts are. So this has been very useful for not only speech, but also for biomedical applications. So if we start with speech, here's an example on the left, you can see uh, a clean speech signal. And this speech signal was played back in a small, medium sized and a large room. So there's a lot more reverberation. The reverberation uh, time of these rooms are different. And if we now look at a 3D plot of what these modulation spectrograms look like, we have clean, we have 250 millisecond reverberation time, and we have one second. And as you can see here, as I mentioned, a lot of the information, so here is frequency, this here is modulation frequency, and then here is just a 3D plot where we have energy instead of a bird's eye view spectrogram-like plot from previously. So you see that a lot of the speech information is constrained to being below 16 Hertz. This has been shown by multiple uh, researchers across the years. But what turns out is very interesting is that as you add noise, this speech information remains intact. So as you can see here, that information remains intact. And this is expected because you can still understand what's being said, it's just that the quality and the intelligibility drops a bit, but you can still understand. So the speech information is still there. And where this noise is showing up is in these higher modulation frequencies. So about 10 years ago, we proposed a, what we call a blind or a non-intrusive metric where we call this information signal, we call the higher part of the modulation spectrum noise. And once you take the ratio, you now have a signal to noise ratio, which we show to be very important to measure the quality of speech, um, for example. And this is a, in a non-intrusive manner. So if you work with speech quality, you know that non-intrusive means 
that you're estimating the quality with only the noisy uh, signal. Whereas an intrusive measure compares the noisy signal with the clean signal, and it looks at differences between the two. So this is a much more, uh, a much more complex problem to tackle because you don't have that clean signal to look at. So this measure uh, was used in several IEEE challenges, such as the reverb and the ACE challenges over the last few years. And um, it turns out that having a non-intrusive quality metric for machine learning could be very interesting, especially if you're doing multimodal uh, machine learning. So suppose you have a system that's relying on uh, four sensors, as you can see here, four different sensors. If one of them malfunctions or if one of them becomes very noisy, it's important for your model to know that because that can give less weight to those particular uh, sensors that are noisy because you don't want that noise to drive the final decision of your system. And what we've shown recently is that instead of just doing simple averaging as we were doing before, if you were to provide this modulation spectrogram as input to a neural network, could the network actually learn a somewhat more complex or nonlinear mapping between those modulation frequencies? And it turns out that it actually can. So as we've uh, recently published here, with a neural network, we can actually achieve results now that are in line with what's uh, obtained with standard intrusive measures. So this is a ITU standard measure uh, called POCA, which relies on a clean and a noisy signal. And these are correlations between uh, this POCA metric and what actual listeners rated as being the quality. And as you can see, we can achieve the same type of performance, but now possible by applying this modulation spectrogram representation to a uh, deep neural network. Uh, it turns out that it's not only quality that it's able to pick out, as you uh, saw from the previous slides, as reverberation time increases, you see the amount of information changing in the higher modulation frequencies. So if we provide this as input to an LSTM, for example, we're able to much better predict reverberation times or room acoustic parameters. Um, so you see here the first line of this table, we're doing much better. And uh, if we compare it to the last line, which is applying just a spectrogram to the same uh, LSTM, you can see how much better you can get by actually providing better discriminative information. So just by changing the input to the model and having that input to be discriminative through signal processing, you can actually get much better performance. Um, and as it turns out, the way that we express emotions through speech also show up in how these uh, spectral bins are modulated over time. So here you can see the modulation spectrogram, that same 3D plot that we saw before, but now for seven different emotions. And um, a few years back, we showed that this representation was interesting for emotion classification. We handcrafted some features from this representation domain and we showed that you could actually, with these handcrafted features, you could get very good discrimination between different types of emotional states. And when we compare with traditional male frequency capture coefficients, for example, we could do much better. So this was in a lifetime prior to this DNN uh, revolution. So of course, we have recently been exploring, well, what happens if we provide this as input to a neural network? Does it learn something better than just simple averaging, than just simple feature engineering? And it turns out that it's indeed the case. Um, it does much better at here in this case, we're predicting uh, arousal levels. So we can do much better at predicting arousal levels than it would with spectrogram features, for example. So this again shows the importance of providing a more clever input to a machine. Um, so that was measuring uh, emotional, that was measuring arousal states. Here we're looking at discrete stress and emotion classification. So again, we provide our modulation spectrogram as an image to uh, a CNN, and we've shown that this does better across all different tasks that we looked at from two class recognition up to nine class emotional state recognition. And this did much better than the benchmark, which relied on conventional classifiers and conventional features. Um, again, one of the issues, if you recall, on training and testing mismatch. Um, well, what if now we've seen that for speech, most of the useful information is in the low modulation frequency areas. So in theory, if you were to provide only that information to your neural network, it would learn how to, in this case here, we're doing speaker verification or speaker identification. So it would learn how to detect speakers regardless of the amount of noise 
in which the data was collected. So we show here that if we train our models on information just from these lower modulation frequencies, we actually do get robustness against noise. So you see here a model trained uh, with this modulation representation with only a subset, whereas a model trained with the entire information. So you can see that at some point, the amount of noise is so high that the signal is buried completely and the model doesn't learn anything. So you get a lot of this mismatch errors and the performance goes down drastically. But if you use signal processing to limit the amount of information that's used to train the neural network, you can actually achieve very good robustness against levels of noise and you can have stable accuracy across different, uh, in this case here, reverberation levels. Um, we've recently, again, if you work with uh, speech enhancement, you know that a lot of the DNN based methods today rely on mean squared error type uh, optimization or loss functions. If you work with speech quality, you know that mean squared error has very poor correlations with quality. So this is somewhat counterintuitive. So we've been uh, starting to look at the use of these non-intrusive quality measures within the loss function uh, of a DNN based enhancement method and preliminary results are coming out suggesting that you get uh, something better. We're still not at state-of-the-art levels, but we are um, slowly getting there. And uh, this year we participated in the DK's challenge. So for those of you who are not aware, this is the detection and classification of acoustic scenes and events. And the ideal is that you're presented with data from 10 different environments and you're supposed to classify them. And here again, we relied on this better discrimination of the modulation spectrogram where these different environments, they activate different parts of the modulation um, region. And this is just two comparisons on the left. If we were to extract features just from the spectrogram, you can see that there's very high overlap between the 10 classes. So for you to discriminate these 10 classes using spectrograms, that's very hard whereas you get a lot more discrimination by using the modulation spectrogram. So on this particular task, you can see how we outperformed um, the baseline system that was provided by the challenge across every single condition um, here. So we were able to detect the 10 different classes with a much more significant than uh, chance levels at 65%, for example. And this came through this improved discrimination by using this uh, signal processing technique prior to the machine learning. Um, so quality assessment is important for speech. It can also be very important for images. So there's another body of literature looking at non-intrusive or single-ended what they're called um, quality metrics. And this is some work from uh, Zhou Wang, from example, from uh, University of Waterloo here in Canada, where he's looked at the impact of different distortions on the naturalness of images, and in this case here, on histograms of wavelet coefficients. So you can see that different levels and different types of noise, they will affect the histogram in different manners. And he's used this information to build uh, what's called non-intrusive metrics of image quality. And if you remember from the previous slides that I showed where adversarial attacks are actually adding some carefully crafted uh, noise types to your images. So we've explored, well, what if we now use these non-intrusive quality measures and see if information that they're extracting that's relevant for the naturalness of the image and relevant for uh, quality, if those could be perhaps useful as tools to detect adversarial attacks. And it turns out we tried several different tools that are available. It turns out that with the best five, you can actually get very good detection accuracy and not only detection accuracy of attacks that were seen during training, but even with completely unseen attacks. So this is something that's very practical because as uh, new systems come out to fool machine, uh, machine learning algorithms day by day, you wanna be able to have a system that will be uh, accurate with these unseen conditions as well. So this was uh, something that we've recently published as well. Um, this is not our work, but this is work that's come out recently as well on how you can use signal processing to actually detect if a video is real or fake. And the idea is you can play around with magnification, you can play around with the RGB channels of a video, and you can actually, from the changes in colors from frame to frame, you can predict what the person's uh, heart rate was. 
based on channel uh, changes in the red channel, for example. So you can detect heart rates. And with these false videos, those heart rates are not realistic. Those aren't uh, values that would be um, present in humans. So their uh, research is showing that you can actually do this um, to detect deep fakes. So this is another example of how signal processing could help. And deep fakes is a critical problem. Um, earlier this year, Facebook AI ran a challenge where hundreds of people submitted systems to try to detect deep fakes. Uh, the top performing system achieved 82% accuracy on, uh, on the data that was provided. And then the organizers ran that system on an unseen new way of generating deep fakes. And that method dropped down to about 65% accuracy. So it's still an area that has a lot of room uh, for work. And I believe signal processing can play a crucial role. So this is definitely something that if you work in related areas, this is something you can uh, explore. And we've talked about multimedia and speech, but a lot of our work has also been on biomedical signals. And much like speech, there is a lot of uh, similarities in the sense that the body cannot cause your, your uh, heart rates to change or your breathing rates or your neuron firings to rate to change in ways that are unnatural. And usually these limitations do not exist when you talk about artifacts and when you talk about noise. Um, so here, for example, on the left uh, or in the middle, you have an electrocardiogram that's measured in clean conditions, uh, zero dB noise and minus 10 dB. So you can see now the heart peaks are completely buried in noise. This signal here, would be completely useless in a, um, in a traditional method. Whereas if you now look at the modulation spectrogram, you can see the clean, the zero dB and the minus 10 dB. This is where the cardiac information is in the uh, red lobes. So you can see that information is still present even though it's corrupted by noise and completely buried in time and frequency domains, it's still uh, detectable within this modulation spectrogram. So you could perhaps develop filters within this uh, modulation representation and bring your signal back to the time domain. So now you have a signal that's completely buried in noise, you can recover the peaks. So from this, you can now have a heart rate detector that would operate in a very noisy signal. Much like we did with speech, you can also measure the quality. You know here what is signal, you know what is noise, you can have a signal to noise ratio. And we've shown that this is also very highly correlated uh, with the quality of the ECG, for example. Um, very similar with brain computer interfaces or electroencephalography. We've been able to show where artifacts, typical artifacts in a brain computer interface lie. We've been able to filter them out in this modulation domain, resynthesize the signals, and then use those signals to train uh, the machine learning algorithms. And we've shown recently that you can actually outperform the waning systems that won these BCI challenges uh, a few years ago. Um, by same, same uh, benefits that we saw in speech by training systems with a representation that separates signal from noise, you can actually achieve much better performance in the noisy environment. So this, for example, was a system uh, that's trying to detect heart rate variability from very noisy ECGs. You can see that we're able to achieve very high accuracy. And if we were to do this with just simple noisy spectrograms as traditional systems do, the accuracy would be uh, much poorer with correlations around 0.2. So you do gain a lot of that train and test mismatch robustness. And when you talk about biomedical and biomedical application, context becomes crucial. Um, so here by context, suppose you are running a system that's trying to detect if a patient who has cardiac disease is having a heart attack or not. If you do not have context and the heart rate goes up suddenly, you don't know if this was due to, for example, the person started walking or running or climbing up the stairs, or if the person was really having a cardiac event. So if you don't incorporate context into your models, you're gonna have a lot of false alarms. Um, so the beauty of using this type of representation where you separate signal from noise, traditionally you would throw away the noise. What we're showing is that noise can actually have a lot of information about the context. So in this particular case here, we show how mining the noise can give us information about what type of activities the person was doing. And we have also shown that you can actually also not only measure the type of activity, but also in this case here, the speed into which the person was uh, walking. So we could 
find the speed in which the person was walking with almost perfect accuracy. And when we compare it to this model A, which is the state of the art right now, which relies on a series of different uh, neural networks, which is very complex, we did much better and which a much simpler model. So this also helps against uh, having to build models that are very complex that have an impact on the, uh, on the environment. Um, and then as a last example uh, on how to get better interpretability. So this is work that we've uh, been doing over the last few years on Alzheimer's disease diagnostics based on electroencephalography. And here on the top, you see what an EEG modulation spectrogram looks like for a healthy control patient, for an Alzheimer's disease patient. And if we here just do signal processing and we take the difference between the two and we look at Fisher's ratio and what would be the regions that would give you the highest discrimination between the two images. This is what you obtain here on the bottom left. So you can see what are the regions that show the most difference between a uh, disease and a non-diseased patient. So originally what we had done was we hand engineered features. This we're talking about 10 years ago. We've hand engineered features use these features to do diagnostics and we show that they did much better at predicting uh, Alzheimer's disease than looking at spectrogram based features, for example. But what was interesting was that not only did they do better, but they were also complementary. So when you added the two together, they were providing complementary information. So what we're currently doing is instead of doing these handcrafted type of uh, features, we're relying on these deep neural networks or CNNs, for example, and looking at saliency maps and class activation maps and seeing what parts of the modulation spectrogram are actually the most discriminative within a machine learning framework. So instead of relying on hand, uh, hand engineering features as we see here on the right, we let the network tell us what regions it's thinking is most discriminative so depending on the type of architecture that you use, depending on the type of task that you're doing and how strict versus non-strict you want to be, you can actually get different representations as you can see here on the left versus on the right. And if you compare, or sorry, the, the left in the middle. And if you compare, for example, this middle image versus the handcrafted image, there's a lot of similarities, but there's also a lot of difference. So there are some key areas that the CNN is telling us is important that we missed when doing hand-crafted uh, engineering before. And it turns out that if we use now these new areas that are found uh, with these saliency maps, we actually get much better performance than with the handcrafted feature and much, much better than using the spectral representations. And uh, in a follow-up study, what we've done is we've actually then correlated these new regions that were found with, for example, cortical hemodynamics information measured from uh, functional infrared spectroscopy. So we have found, for example, that these new regions that were found are highly correlated with cortical hemodynamics. So this now provides extra information, extra interpretability uh, to these models, and it provides extra information to potential treatment um, or what could be causing the disease. Um, so I know this is a telecommunications conference. I've been watching a few presentations, looking at the program. There's a lot of talk about 5G and the importance of 5G. So uh, this is just one last little slide I wanted to show. And this is a direction that we're heading towards. Um, I believe that 5G, when coupled with augmented reality and virtual reality, it will actually revolutionize um, a lot of this virtual landscape that we talk about now. So we can talk about tactile internets and portable virtual reality where you can now have different training methods, different diagnostic methods, different gaming approaches. And being able to do this in a portable way, um, coupled with artificial intelligence, I think will revolutionize a number of domains. So we've started now implementing a lot of these brain computer interfaces or human monitoring directly into, for example, virtual reality headsets. And the idea now is to couple signal processing with machine intelligence, with 5G, with virtual reality, to kind of bring all of these things together and build new applications, not only for gaming and for uh, training, but also for diagnostics, for example. Um, so if this is something that people are working on or interested in, this is definitely an area we're interested in moving towards and we'd love to, uh, to collaborate. Um, so if anything you take out from today, 
I hope that it's, you can't, uh, I think from now on, just focus on machine learning, just focus on signal processing. I think the two have to go uh, together hand in hand. And um, I hope to have convinced you that this modulation spectral signal representation that we've built is actually useful. And if you're working in speech and biomedical applications, I invite you to try it out, to play with it. Uh, there's still many, many areas that have been untouched that I believe could benefit from this type of approach. Um, a lot of the software, we have open toolboxes, as you can see here, a lot of these toolboxes are available on our website. So I invite you to please download them, play with them, uh, provide feedback, reach out for collaborations. We're always open to collaborations. Of course, none of this wouldn't have been possible without all the students that are involved in this research, all the funding agencies. And I thank you for your time. And I believe we still have 10 minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Chago. I was applauding here, but then I forgot we are uh, remote, so it doesn't have the same uh, uh, result. Uh, I put here the question on the chat. If anyone has any questions to Professor Falk, uh, you can write it down. Uh, I have one to start. Uh, as Chago said, we have about 10 minutes to go. Uh, we have another uh, technical session right after this. I have one, Tiago. Uh, I first met Tiago when I was doing some research on rever reverberation, and I tried to publish some stuff, and I found out that Tiago was the reference. He, he, he wrote most of the, the, the classic works on that field. So it was very interesting to know a Brazilian a researcher, and I came to know Tiago a little bit further on more. And uh, besides an excellent researcher, he's also a, a great person also. Uh, too bad that, that I haven't been abroad too long to get to meet him more. Uh, Thiago, uh, as I mentioned already, I have a lot of interest on uh, reverberation and I've been working also on reverberation time estimation. And I have some question regarding that. Uh, you, I think, you, I believe you showed one slide for us. Uh, uh, and I think you showed by using these modulation spectrogram, the technique, uh, you, I think as you call it, uh, you've got excellent results by estimating the reverberation time. Uh, does your method work with noisy signals? I believe so, but does it get better results uh, comparatively with the other techniques with higher levels of noise, uh, uh, different kinds of noises as well? Uh, could you comment a little bit on the topic, please? Yep. So here on the slide that you see on the screen, um, this is the performance. So this is uh, root mean squared error. So here we're not predicting T60, we're predicting T30. Yeah. Um, which is related. So here we have the RMSC and the median absolute difference between the predicted and the true measure. And this is for varying um, SNRs. So this is reverberation and noise together. So you can get a, a feel here as to where uh, we are. And these are different approaches looking at different representations. So here's an, a spectrogram based representation. This is the conventional SRMR, just looking at uh, averages and so on. So you can see that in one particular case, it did better at zero dB, but otherwise the neural network approach uh, was much better. And again, this was, I believe this is now maybe three, four years old. Um, there are even better things than LSTMs, maybe bidirectional LSTMs might provide even better information because you're looking at maybe tails from both ends and things like that. So this could even be perhaps something that could be improved on um, with more recent networks. Just to complement my question is that, uh, I was going to ask you, but I think you, you answered already in your last slide. Uh, do you have these uh, codes available for, uh, for other people to experiment in that page you showed us? Yeah. And so, did, you, uh, did you use that challenge? Uh, uh, what what database do you use uh, in this work in particular? That reverberation challenge you mentioned already. Um, we have a number of data sets for um, reverberation, and we also generate a lot of our data sets from the ACE challenge. I think is one of the most. Uh, relevant because the noise patterns are actually also added to the room and pulse responses. So when you have a room and pulse response and you add noise, it's actually 
a lot more relevant. Um, so we do have a number of recorded as well as synthetic data sets. This one here in particular, I am going to assume it was a synthetic one because we also added noise at 0, 10, and 20 dB. I don't believe those were the levels in the ACE and reverb challenges. So these might be synthetically generated. Um, but definitely reach Thank out. Um, and if we have a data set that's available that we can share, we can definitely do that. Okay, I'll definitely be accessing these uh, pages you show us. Uh, actually, not me, but probably my students. <laughs> I'll ask them to access and I uh, hope to keep in touch with you. Uh, do we have any questions from the audience? You're free to ask questions in Portuguese if you wish. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, there's one in the chat. Can you read the chat or should I read it to you? Or Fast literature and time frequency representations seems to be still stuck to classical spectrograms and machine learning applications. Um, yes, I believe so. And that's what I hoped to show today. And I think a lot of the advances that we see in machine learning, if you notice, they all come from computer vision first. And they usually happen in computer vision. So CNNs, uh, many of these different innovations that are coming out rely on images as input. So the spectrogram, uh, and this is my personal opinion, the spectrogram is the simplest image you can generate from a speech signal, for example. Um, so I think spectrograms are widely used because a lot of people are just trying to very quickly test tools that were developed for images on speech and other representations. Um, and I think it's our role and our responsibility as signal processing researchers. I know many of us are signal processing researchers at heart. I think this is where we can make a lot of these innovations as we can bring this signal processing expertise to the machine learning expertise and make some innovations. Because right now I feel the machine learning community is more interested in the algorithm part and not necessarily on the input. They just believe that more data come in, you're, you're better off. Um, so if the simplest representation is a spectrogram, that's what you put as input. So I think there's a lot of room there um, for improvement for sure. Uh, I have, uh, thank you so much, Douglas, and thank you also, Thiago, for this answer. I have one quick one, uh, a quick question, which I think is uh, provocative a little bit. Just uh, we recently changed the name of this conference to, it was a uh, uh, Conferencia Brasileira de Telecomunicações and incorporated the signal processing uh, part of for this name. Do you think in a few years we will be incorporating machine learning also to the name of this conference? If you, um, I think we've met multiple times at ICASP. And if you attend ICASP these days, there's very few works on signal processing. It's most machine learning. Most of the top ICASP, papers and I paper awards. And so, on. so all of these things have signal processing in their titles. And I know the last few years, there's been a big push to change the names of these, these uh, traditional conferences to bring that new reality. And I think time and again, the take home message is that everybody knows ICASP, we shouldn't change the name. Um, but I think more and more for sure, I think the machine learning innovations are gonna be taking over. And I think even now in this particular event, I think maybe a third of the uh, sessions are related to machine intelligence and things like that. And even the ones that don't have the title machine intelligence, a lot of the papers are using machine learning within them. Um, so I think instead of signal processing, it should be information processing because you're still in processing information with, uh, with machine learning, right? Okay, Thiago, thank you so much. Uh, so kind for you to participate in this event. Uh, also, I think also you are an example for a lot of students They are here. Uh, a successful Brazilian researcher. Of course, we have very, very successful Brazilian researchers here in Brazil. But it's always nice to talk to someone that's all uh, that's abroad that had the Brazilian education and also has this great personality. Thank you so much. 
Okay, thank, thank you, you everyone so also for attending this, uh, this talk. Thank you for the organizers, the, the conference organizers, for uh, having the whole conference itself and the talking. And that's it. Uh, any final words if you want to talk, Chago? Be my guest. No, just feel free to reach out. Um, I'll put here again labs website, our Twitter, YouTube, GitHub. Uh, feel free to reach out if you're interested in collaborations. We collaborate with a number of uh, researchers in Brazil. We have a number of projects together with Katis and uh, so our doors are always open. We also have lots of visiting students come to visit us in the summer. Now it's a bit trickier with pandemic, but we even have uh, interns right now from Brazil who are working remotely with us. So the doors are always open um, for collaborations and collaborators. Excellent. Thank you, Dan Thiago. Thank you, the organizers. And most, mostly, thank you for the whole audience for this very pleasant talk. Okay. See you then. Bye-bye. Bye, Thiago. Bye, everyone.